one of my modest objectives in life is to eliminate broadcast media. <laughs> and uh, for that very reason, I don't wish to become one here or anywhere else. And, and as it turns out, each of you has in your seat rest, the, the, the shoulder, the armrest, a microphone. Have you see them? Your arm. Now I don't, you know, I don't want all hell to break loose at once. <laughs> but I'm just telling you that you have mics, and uh, you should feel free to interrupt me anytime you think I'm saying something that is just complete bollocks, <laughs> or just so wonderful that you have to tell me that you've never heard such wisdom before in your life. Uh, there are a lot of things that I can talk about, and I will start out by talk by making my primary point early, uh, which is that, that I think, you know, it was very interesting hearing Tim this morning because Tim sometimes is, is uh, set up as my opponent in the, in the kind of odd caricatures that the public draws. Uh, you know, and I, I was a, regarded to be a, a cyber utopian and, and he was a more reasonable voice. And I can sort of see how that came to pass because there was a period when I felt like, uh, you know, as Alan Kay said, the best way to, to predict the future is to invent it. I also believed that the best way to invent the future was to predict it. And there was a certain point where I felt like if I were sunny enough in my predictions, I could get enough people to believe that the future looked good, uh, that we would be like, you know, sort of like Wiley e. Coyote. We'd be well out over the chasm before we realized that we didn't have much footing. Uh, and I have known ever since I encountered the internet that it was it was both the most liberating tool I had ever seen for humanity and the best system for extremely granular surveillance that had ever been devised, and that it would always be that way, uh, and that there was always going to be, throughout my lifetime, a battle between the forces of openness and connection and uh, freedom from repression and the forces of secrecy and repression and, and uh, well, the usual, the usual contest between love and fear that I think is what happens on the material plane and, and the reason that we're here in the first place. And so I will say in the beginning that even though I do think that technology tends to be a zero-sum game, we are in a very interesting moment in human history in that for the first time, we have it within range to make it possible for anybody, anywhere, to know everything that he is intellectually capable of assimilating about any topic. That is to say, he can know as much, whether he's in the uplands of Mali or midtown Manhattan, about some nuance of molecular biology as is presently known by anybody. Now, I understand that knowledge also has a context, and this is much likelier to be the case if it's not in the uplands of Mali, since you won't have so many people to discuss it with. But I mean, there is, I think, the possibility that we can convey to future generations the right to know, the right to know as much as they want to know. And that includes everything that is presently known and generally applicable by anybody. And it also includes everything that is known or can be known about what one's government is doing. Uh, unfortunately, it may, oh, it, it may also include a little more than many of us would prefer to be known about our private lives. Not that I'm, I'm for giving everybody the right to know, the, you know your private sexual habits, but I mean, I, I'm afraid that we are devising a thing that is either easy 
to censor or not easy to censor. Uh, and, and it is all of one piece. And if you can shut down, if you can shut it down to one kind of information, you can also shut it down to another. And so what we have to start doing, instead of worrying about what the technology can or can't do, is to think about what we want to do with the technology and what our intentions are. And I think there are a lot of things that are, you know, suddenly up for grabs just in the last few days uh, that I think are pretty interesting. Um, let me back up a little bit. I recently, along with Daniel Ellsberg and Glenn Greenwald and Jenny Jardin and several others, uh, Laura Poitras, started something called the uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation. Now, it's an innocuous sounding name for something that is not terribly innocuous because what it does is it makes it possible to do money laundering for WikiLeaks uh, perfectly visibly and nobody can do anything about it and we're, we are taking rather large donations in for WikiLeaks and a number of other organizations that the government doesn't like much and um, you know or are, are trying to inspire other leaks and actually getting them inspired rather rapidly it seems now uh, and one of the things that just got released today was an 18 page document that I haven't even had a chance to read yet, which is Obama's uh, instructions to all of the federal agencies for, uh, for cyber warfare. I mean, it, I realized what I was looking at, and I thought, my God, you know, holy shit. And yet, and yet not. And yesterday we had, we had PRISM. Now, I've known for some time that PRISM existed. I think it's marvelous that they've decided to, to be forthcoming about it. <laughs> and I, I think part of the reason that they decided to become forthcoming about it was because they, they are actually recognizing that there is now so much force behind the desire to open up government that no matter how high they hang Bradley Manning or how long they keep Julian Assange uh, in his little room over at the Ecuadorian embassy, the dam is leaking badly and will go on leaking badly. And it's one of those things like intellectual property or so-called intellectual property. The, the harder you try to enforce these laws, the more brittle you become in, in uh, your draconian efforts to see that they stay intact, the less credible your government is, and eventually, the more you realize that you simply have to open up and be who you claim to be, which is somebody who defends liberty and openness of expression. PRISM itself is not as diabolical as it would seem. Uh, and and I'll, I'll tell you the, the main reason I believe that. I mean, I. I work with these guys. I mean, I, EFF both sues the NSA and I, I do consulting to them. And, and, the, and the reason that I do consulting to them is because there are a lot of people inside the CIA and the NSA who actually do care about the Constitution and they also care about trying to figure out how to make it possible for the people who are making policy decisions in the United States and elsewhere to make them on the basis of very good information. Uh, they exceed those directives on occasion, and they have been quite a lot lately. But, I mean, generally, the NSA, unlike the CIA, doesn't have any drones, and it's really just trying to find out what's going on, and it's trying to identify those things that you really would actually rather not happen. And the way in which they do that at the moment is to try to take an entire picture of all the communications that are happening through the networks into and out of the United States at any given moment, not because they actually want to get down into those packets and find out what's being said, but because they want to be able to have a sense of the entire range of background noise so that they can start to do pattern recognition on signal. And they're very specific about what signal they want. 
Now, this is not to say that there's no reason to worry about them because they're developing tools that could possibly be used in nefarious ways. It's just that the people who presently have those tools are two things that should give you some comfort. They are concerned about the Constitution of the United States, and they are somewhat incompetent. <laughs> we are spared their despotism by their incompetence most of the time. And they don't realize, or they haven't fully come to grips with the fact that there is a huge difference between data and information. And that having more data does not mean you have more information, because information is very specific. It has relevance. It's something that, that a human mind, it's, it's, a, it's a little piece of, it's a bunch of data that a human mind has found to be relevant within a context that only a human mind can decide. And having a bigger and bigger haystack does not necessarily make it easier to find the needles of information in that haystack. And you will notice that they don't seem to be getting a hell of a lot better at identifying the things that they would rather not have go on. They still go on. And the fact is that they're going to go on. I mean, you know, if a couple of, if a couple of completely insane people with meat cleavers want to behead somebody in the middle of a public thoroughfare, all the examinations of cyberspace are not going to stop that from happening. Life is going to have this beastly element. And we can't go on trying to, trying to do everything within our capacity to stop it without creating a situation where we have completely undermined any ability to be free. Now, there are a bunch of things that we can talk about with regard to what might be an obstacle of the right to know. I'm not going to go on at excessive length about intellectual property, except to say that I think it's an oxymoron. And that I don't think that you can declare something to be property if you can, if you can reproduce it infinitely at zero cost and distribute it infinitely at zero cost. And if it actually makes more economic sense to do so than it does to regulate towards scarcity. And I, I expect that this is an audience where I'm not going to get a lot of argument about that. I don't see anybody just clutching for his, his hand mic just yet, but if somebody <laughs> feels obliged to, go on. Uh, there is, of course, the legitimate concern about privacy. And privacy is a very, very complicated subject because, well, for one thing, you know, I'm not sure why people, exactly who wants privacy and why. I think it's very, very contextual. Uh, now, I grew up in a place where nobody had any privacy, which is rather like the places where the, where the founders of, of the United States grew up. I mean, the reason that privacy is not in the Constitution is because it was not something that was recognized as being a possibility in the latter part of the 18th century. But, but everybody in my little town knew everything about everybody else in my little town. And we were spared you know, the, the ill effects of all that knowledge by, by mutually assured destructive capacity. <laughs> you know, somebody wanted to, wanted to rattle the skeletons in my closet, I knew where their bodies were buried. And we had a kind of tolerance toward each other that made sense in a small agricultural town that was filled with eccentrics. On the other hand, a lot of people in the latter part of the 20th century and the early, early part of the 21st worked for large organizations who have this mythology about how human beings are fundamentally like interchangeable machine parts and that human behavior can be homogenized, and that we're not all weird as shit, which in fact we are. Uh, and they've been trying to maintain that, that notion, uh, and we've been going along with them and being very zealous, most of us, about our privacy, lest they find out that we have these odd little practices that we have. Well, that sort of thing, I think, is going to go away largely because I see people from the younger generation making a public statement of their weirdnesses. 
just as a, I mean, you know, you get a face tattoo and it means that you've decided you do not want to work for IBM unless IBM changes <laughs> fundamentally. And I think that large organizations will change fundamentally. And one of the things that will necessarily be imposed upon us by the fact that everybody becomes so visible will be that uh, if you want to have groups of people working together, you're going to have to be much more tolerant of their individual idiosyncrasies because everybody will know what they are. Now, I'm not comfortable with that. As long as you have cultural warfare going on uh, where there are authorities with moral considerations that are much, much more severe than IBM's hiring practices. And as one might expect, the internet does not entirely welcome to monotheism. Monotheism has been functioning for a long time on the basis of its ability to create reality distortion fields around a very narrow set of, of words. All the monotheistic religions have a book. And in addition to that book, they have some other books. And within those various books is what, what can and should be known, and that, is, and that is properly reality. Well, you know, the internet is not good for that system. Uh, it it makes, makes it very difficult to maintain that sort of thing. And so what you have is the war between monotheism and pantheism being, being writ large on a lot of different levels. And, you know, all of, the, all of the monotheistic religions are behaving very badly at the moment because they're, because they're under a very severe assault that, and, and at the... At the risk of a future in which they will not exist in their present form. Now, how we make it through that transition uh, and how, and, 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 you know, and, and I do not, you know, I'm not just talking about Islam. I'm talking about, I'm talking about monotheism as manifested by, say, the United States of America, the nation state style government, which is represented you know, by a set of beliefs that are largely religious, even if they're not. Uh, that kind of power is having a very difficult time, and it's actually not working very well either. It's, it's in a state of information shock. And the only way in which it can start to work, actually, is opening up so that everybody can start to examine what's going on and, and be part of, the, of what has to be a horizontal process instead of a, a hierarchical process. So we're, you know, these are, these are tough times for those contests. Uh, I, I am optimistic as I, as, as I have always been, but I'm optimistic because I choose to be in large part. Uh, I, had a, I had a conversation with my friend Jaron Lanier the other night who's written a new book called Who Owns the Future. And Jaron, rather like Tim Wu, and uh, less like Tim, uh, who's more like me, uh, and, and, and Evgeny Morozov, has found it convenient to start talking about the, the dark aspects of the future and how, how the the natural gathering of, of uh, authority and power at the top of the network stack is not something that we can do very much about, and uh, the future is looking increasingly gloomy. And, and I, after the reading, I said, Jaron, you know, you can make an equally good argument against every single thing you've said tonight. And he said, well, I was sort of hoping you would do that for me. And I said, well, it was your book reading. Uh, but you know, the fact is that, that one can do both of those things. And it is, it is this interesting time where there are very many reasons to be absolutely delighted and very many reasons to be afraid. Uh, I, was, 
I, I had an interesting experience over the weekend. I went to Sean Parker's wedding. And Sean Parker is worth $4 billion because he had a, he put together a really, really propitious meeting between uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Peter Thiel. Now, I wouldn't trade places with Sean Parker under any circumstances. You know, it's a, and nor do I think Facebook is a, is a good thing, in spite of the fact that I've been spending most of my life trying to create connection and digital community. Uh, I, I don't think that, that the global suburbs as manifested by pa Facebook is what I had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> but at that wedding, I, I, I spent time with Jimmy Wales. You know, I, I knew Jimmy Wales when he was still, you know, fooling around trying to make a living doing pornography online. And, uh, and when he first came up with the idea of Wikipedia, I, I said, well, wow, I take a very sunny view of humanity. But I think you're nuts if you think that Wiki... <laughs> I mean, this is going to be the, the most rapidly accumulating pile of nonsense <laughs> and intentional misinformation and slander and horseshit and you know, all the things that you know, are worst about humanity. And as I always do whenever I see Jimmy, I say, isn't it a miracle? <laughs> it is a miracle. Because every time I go to w Wikipedia where I actually know something about the entry, uh, you know, and that happens to be quite a lot of things, <laughs> I don't find that there's much that I would change about it. It's as true as I, as I know how to make it myself. I don't immediately want to start editing things. And, you know, and I also have reached the point where if I, if I think that I might be talking shit, which I do often, uh, fully believe, I mean, you know, that it's, it's not the stuff, it's not the stuff you know that, it's not the stuff you don't know that gets you, it's the stuff you know that isn't true that gets you. And I have a lot of that, and thanks to Wikipedia, I no longer have quite so much of it because every time I think I might be doing something like that, I whip out my iPhone and find out that I'm wrong, and I'm these days much more likely to be telling you something that is interesting and true than something that is interesting and not true. So we have these two forces going on, and they are, and they are going on at a fabulous rate. And we are headed into places that I think are, are a little difficult for human beings to fully comprehend, uh, except for the fact that I, I, take some, I take some solace in the fact that my mother, who was born in Wyoming in 1905 and died at the age of 94 and actually lived a quarter of her life in a condition where the fastest way to move information was a galloping horse and was doing, you know, video chats with me by the time she was done. Saw all these, these transformations in telecommunications and yet when she told stories, which she told a lot of, the telecommunications environment never showed up. The medium was more or less invisible. What really counted was the usual stuff. You know, the, the never-ending grace, uh, dance between the three graces and the seven deadly sins that characterize most of human behavior. So what it really comes down to is, you know, it's not that the tools are necessarily malignant or that the, that the organizations that have the tools are necessarily malignant. It's just that there are dark things in each one of us that we have to be accountable to and we have to think about how to overcome. Uh, and I, I think those are the kinds of choices that we have to be making. And I think that we also have to be making a lot of choices around what is likely to serve the future. And if you want the future that I want, and I think many in this room do, where everybody can know everything that they can know, there are some things that you have, to, you have to try to find other ways to deal with. One of them, obviously, is, is secrecy in government. 
or, or imposition of secrecy, whether it's corporate or governmental or whatever. Uh, one of them obviously is the idea that you can own thought. I mean, you cannot own free speech. It just doesn't work that way. There are, and there are plenty of ways to monetize expression. And I've done quite well for somebody who, who's given his away all his life. Uh, so it's not, it's just a matter of understanding that expression is a service and not a noun. It's understanding that, that, that this word content actually doesn't apply very well to something that doesn't have a container. And it's a matter of understanding that, that, that consumers are not, you know, they're not the same thing if they're reading or listening to music as they are if they're eating a hamburger or buying a toaster. You know, it's a matter of getting our heads out of some old paradigms. And it's also a matter of coming to grips, and I want to, I want to finish with, with addressing a lot of what Tim was talking about this morning. It's a matter of coming to grips with how we have a multiplicity of means by which one bit can get from one place to another. Because I think that's actually one of the central considerations we have. The people who designed the internet were, well, I can't tell you how lucky I think we were to have those people. They were, they were a gift, truly, to humanity, each and every one of them. I was recounting, having asked Paul Barron one time whether what he was thinking when he, when he um, designed packet switching was a, was a network that that couldn't be decapitated by a nuclear attack. And he smiled slyly and said, no, I was thinking about a network that didn't have a head. So he knew exactly what he was doing. And Vint Cerf knew exactly what he was doing when, when he decided that he was just going to turn TCP IP loose and not just simply use it within the confines of, of the network that DARPA had asked him to define because he knew that it was going to be like a, like a virus, which it has been. So those guys, we were very blessed by those guys. And, and, and what, has, what has come to constitute the largest threat, I think, to what those fellows tried to do is the fact that it is expensive or has been expensive in the way in which we've been doing it to create large networks for getting bits around, especially wireless bits, especially the way in which we deal with wireless. And so there has been a concentration, as Tim was talking about, of, of enormous power that's rather like what we had with the telephone company before Judge Green saw fit to break it up. And Increasingly, we have institutions, and they range from Comcast to the App Store, that, are in, that have no Bill of Rights. They have no, they have no particular responsibilities behind, besides that thing that you, you click at the bottom of 92 pages of text that you don't read. Uh, and, and they are in a position to determine a lot about what you can or can't read and will be unless we come up with ways to create competition there. And I think the real challenge is not so much legal, because I, I don't see any particular willingness on the part of governments anywhere on the planet to engage in the kind of antitrust law that I, I think would be salutary at this point. Governments are scared, and they want to see concentrations uh, for all the reasons that Tim is talking about. What we have to do is to come up with ways of creating more ways of getting bits around that are guerrilla ways of getting bits around. We have to start invading the spectrum with computational radio signal so that we can grab large chunks of white space and use the spectrum powerfully to, to, to get a lot of information through it, which we can do. 
almost invisibly, and I think eventually visibly. We have to, we have to, to create more tunnels inside the networks that are not particularly visible to those people who maintain them. And we have to convince the people who run the networks, and this is what I'm going to be doing on Tuesday in Washington. I, you know, I, I'm talking to various telecommunications carriers who are just starting to wake up to the fact that bandwidth is an abundance economy, that it is dumb to regulate bandwidths towards scarcity because it's one of those things where the more you have, the shorter it feels. And the best way to get people to want a lot of your product is to give them a lot of your product because they'll just want more of it. You start doing that, if that becomes your policy and you have a great deal of opportunity to do it given all the fiber that presently lies scattered around still unlit or, or inefficiently lit, uh, then you know the opportunities for the rest of us to create more wormholes through all that that we can use as our own network, I think, I think are pretty promising. I don't think we need to blow up the internet and make a new one at all. We just need to, to uh, run more tunnels through the, ones that we've, through the one we've got and to make sure that if I want to get a packet from one place to another, it can go there even if it has to go quite a ways around grandfather's farm. Another one of the initiatives that I'm, in, I'm involved in that you, you might take an interest in and and be, become involved in yourselves is a couple of years ago, three years ago, I, I guess it is, uh, I went to Iceland and I proposed that Iceland make itself the Switzerland of bits. And Iceland being the country that it is, they took me seriously. Or there was a member of, of parliament that named Birgitta Johnstadter who took me seriously and a number of other folks and they've actually gone a long ways toward putting into effect uh, a lot of the things that, that I think are necessary in order, to, in order for Iceland to be a place where you can put information that would be prescribed from servers elsewhere. Now, it's not going to just work for Iceland to do this. There's going to have to be a number of places that do this, and they're going to have to be connected in ways that are difficult for the nation states to disconnect. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of places like like uh, Ireland and New Zealand and Ecuador, and I, I think they're probably Tonga. There are a number of countries that I think we can start to get to be part of this conspiracy, and it's a perfectly open conspiracy. And uh, I think that I think that 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 may lie uh, in that direction may lie part of the future that we want to create. But you know, the fact is, folks, I'm. I am now at that point in, the, in my entry into the future where I'm groping and I'm just trying to do the best I can with the tools I've got. 